Yeah. Hey. 
Praise 71. We'll sing a verse or two here. 71. Sweet hour of prayer. <coughs>
Miss Glory and uh, Ashlyn and Braden, y'all come and sing for us tonight. So you pray for them as they get ready to sing. over in the book of James, chapter number 4, Ezekiel chapter number 22, when you found your place, say amen, real amen. Amen. amen, amen, as you know, many of these, uh, what may consider what may be considered the major or even the minor prophets, they are talking to a people that have gone astray and they've backslidden. They're out of God's will and God's using these men. He's using these times to try to, to get them back where they need to be. And this is, uh, this is no different, to be honest. Uh, but I want to take a, a thought out of Ezekiel chapter 22, verse number 30. And uh, it says, and I sought for a man among them. Now, <laughs> there was a little bit of talk before church about preaching about the women. And uh, I preached on the men for three weeks. So I don't want none of you men to get scared by that, that first phrase there. Uh, I sought for a man among them that uh, should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I want to focus in on this thought here. Uh, he's seeking for a man, he says, that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap for me. 
I want to preach on this thought tonight, no trespassing, God's property. No trespassing, God's property. If I had, uh, if I could use a prop, it would be just this simple sign that says private property, no trespassing. And to be quite honest, that is the premise of the message tonight, is that we, it was said today that we do not belong to ourselves. Nothing that we have belongs to us, and even our souls belong to someone other than us. And uh, there needs to be a very well visible, a well posted sign on our lives. And so that's the thought that we'll take tonight. No trespassing, God's property. Uh, if you if you turn over to James chapter number four. Verse number 7, the Word of God says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, I, I want to pray here in just a minute, but before I do, I, I want to notice something here uh, in verse number 7 in the book of James, chapter number 4. The very first word in this verse is, Submit yourselves. Submit in other words, you need to prefer someone other than yourselves. And the Scripture has given us a, a, a word that we can take with us every day. He's, and there's a lot of people that will take this verse and they'll run with the last phrase, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And they'll put that thing in their back pocket. And uh, if they run into trouble, they'll say, I resist you, Satan. But the problem is they never read the first part of that phrase. Problem is, there's a lot of people hoping that Satan will leave them alone yeah. <clears throat> that haven't submitted to God. Amen. And if we truly want to hold on to this, this uh, let's just call it for sake of argument, this promise at the end of verse number 7 here, we're going to have to get through that first phrase and submit ourselves to God. And if Amen. we can do that, then we can... Take God at his word here and uh, honor what he says and resist the devil. To be quite honest, whether or not the devil flees from you, before you can truly resist the devil, you're going to have to submit yourself to God. Amen. Whether the very end of that phrase is there and he will flee from you, whether that was ever written or not, if you're going to resist the devil, you're going to have to submit yourself to God. Let's pray and ask God to touch us tonight. Dear Father, we love you. We thank you for your blessings. Lord, the good singing. Lord, the good spirit we felt this morning and again tonight. God, we're thankful, Lord, that we can come to you not only in prayer but in worship. And we can worship you and we can honor you with our, our words of praise and adoration. But even uh, the word of God, we thank you for that. And we thank you for what has been taught and, and preached <clears throat> this morning. And God, we ask you to meet with us again tonight. Allow us to preach the thought that you've laid upon our heart tonight. I pray that you would encourage me as the preacher. But Lord, we ask you that you would encourage and strengthen all of us as hearers tonight. We praise you and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, I want to give you this thought here in Exodus, or excuse me, in Ezekiel chapter number 22, uh, verse number 30. We'll give you just a little bit of uh, some definitions and we'll give you the thought and go to the house. But again, it says, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. Here's the sad um, reality of this verse, but I found none. And I frankly do not want to be counted in that number none. <clears throat> I want to be counted in that one that did stand up, that did make a hedge about something, that did stand in the gap. And that's, uh, that's my heart tonight. Uh, as we look in, uh, in the, just the title of the message we see, uh, the word trespass, no trespassing. Uh, this as a noun, it means entry into another's property without right or permission. Or as a verb, it means to pass beyond or to pass through limits or boundaries. Uh, just on our little road that we live on, there's, a, uh, uh, there's been maybe possibly a, a change of ownership of some land 
uh, there close to the corner. And uh, now all of a sudden there, where there used to be an open driveway where you could go down to the lake, now there's a cable drawn across there where there used to be no, uh, no posted signs. Now there's no trespassing uh, signs on trees and power poles and things of that sort. I have noticed that people seem to be honoring that, but, but I feel as though there's a lot of times that folks post on private property, and to be quite honest, it's kind of an invitation. There's something special over here. Y'all come on. Don't worry about the sign. But today, we need to understand that this trespassing uh, that we're talking about, and remember, no trespassing. This is God's property. Uh, we need to post it and understand that we are declaring uh, that there shall be no entry into this property without right or permission. How uh, We need to declare that no one should pass beyond these limits or beyond these boundaries. Uh, but I'm ashamed to say today that there are many Christians, uh, some even part of this assembly, uh, that have taken down all of their signs of, of trespassing, all of their signs of boundaries, and they've allowed things to sneak into their lives. They've allowed things to sneak into their families. And I'll be quite honest with you tonight, uh, they have been devastated by those things. They've been devastated by those little ideals and ideas that they've had. And it's, it's, a, it's a, 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 an effect of taking down this sign of no trespass. Not only that, but we see in our text the word hedge. The word hedge, again, it is, is a noun and a verb. As a noun, it means a fence formed by rows of closely planted shrubs. Now, I heard a long time ago that, uh, that in those uh, days, those ancient days, that they would take those, those uh, vines that had those long thorns on them, and they would uh, press those things as a fence around their sheep or around their cattle, and those uh, uh, thorns would go down into the ground, and so if if an animal tried to go over it, it would uh, maybe short jump, and it would fall on those thorns. If an animal tried to go underneath it as it began to dig, they would run into those thorns, and they would be hindered, and it was very effective. But as a verb, it also means to enclose or bound in, to restrict or hinder. What does the Word of God say? I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge. Now, as we use it as a noun to make up that fence formed by rows, listen to this, of closely planted shrubs. I wonder if that might be a picture of what the church ought to be, a close body of believers. I'm worried about many churches today. I said this from the get-go of this COVID-19. I'm worried about the effect of, of Facebook Live. I'm worried about the effect of, of uh, media as far as the Internet, of folks getting comfortable, of staying at the house and not coming to the house of God, uh, of taking their time and getting back in, or saying, well, I missed this Sunday. It'll be, on the, it'll be on the Internet. I've been very, very concerned about that. And I believe that there are some, not just here, but I believe that there are some in countless churches around the world that are dependent on some preacher to go live at some point. Y'all going to have to help me or I'm coming down there with you. There's somebody hoping that somebody will go live so they can say they went to church on Sunday. I guarantee you today, bless God, if I have any uh, finger in me, I'm going to get up. I want to go to the house of God. Amen. Amen. I want to be a close body of believers because there is a hedge that God wants about some things. Not only that, but as we look at our text, we see that I saw a man that he would be a, a part of this hedge, to be a part of this enclosing or restricting or this thing that is hindered. Understand that the church is and has been under attack. Not only is the church under attack, the body of believers, the very assembly of believers are under attack. The word of God is under attack. And I firmly believe today that we need men and we need women and young folks that will stand up and say this is private property. There is no Amen. trespassing. I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm going to build up a hedge. I'm not going to let the devil in. I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm not going to let the world in. I'm not going to let this contemporary movement in. I want to stand in the gap. I want to find the old past. I want to seek them out. And I want to walk there. 
That was just the definitions. <clears throat> now let's try to get into the introduction. <clears throat> I may bypass that all together. I believe I've said what I needed to say there. There is an attitude. <clears throat> There's an attitude in our society that anything goes. Right. Uh, you, you watch TV. We don't have regular TV. We have what's called Roku, so it's internet TV. And uh, you still sh see the same shows, but the uh, the commercials are, are number one, they're redundant. It's the same thing over and over. But you don't hardly see a Ford commercial or a Chevrolet commercial or a, I don't know, restaurant commercial. Most of the time it's medication or it's, uh, uh, it's another television show, commercial, something like that. But I cannot tell you how many times we've been sitting there as a family and some uh, commercial comes on about some medication that will help someone. And through it all, through the entirety of this commercial, you see folks with uh, celebrating same-sex marriage or at least same-sex relationships. You see these things that, that, that at one point were so taboo, even the people that were partaking in it would not openly talk about it. Uh, but now it seems so commonplace in the media, in our society, at Walmart, at Burger King, at uh, uh, even daycares and things of this sort. It seems as though sin has come into not only society but to the church. And it's as if we are declaring anything goes. Anything goes. We've, we've warped the attitude of the songwriter's words just as I am. Honey, I'm going to tell you something. I believe he meant what he said. Come as you are. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor in a heavy lake, I will give you rest. Hebrews chapter number 4, that talks about that rest that God will give you. But I assure you today, if you take God at his word and you come to him, you may come beaten down, broken, bruised, battered. You may come dirty, wicked, vile. But honey, I guarantee you one thing. You won't leave the same way you got here. That's right. I'm about ready to preach, but Tim, Come on. but Tim, you, you, you took my thunder this morning. I was slow to preach this morning. I asked him, I said, you can preach in the morning or at night. He said, whatever you want. I'm like, well, I'm going to give him in the morning. And I was chomping at the bit. I was hoping you'd preach five minutes. I was going to get up and preach for something. But folks, that attitude of anything goes, unfortunately, is in the churches today. That's right. And we've got to wipe it clean. We've got to wipe it out of our vocabulary. And we've got to declare. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be cheesy, but we, we've got to declare that this is private property. Amen. We've got to declare today that there is no trespassing. It's time today that we put the devil on notice and say, Mr. Devil, sir, I am God's son. I am God's daughter. I am a child of the king. And you are, listen. We need to tell him that he is a liar because apparently he's forgotten, Samuel. He's so convinced that he's telling the truth that he has convinced us that he's telling the truth. And we're going right along with him. Right along with him. He's a deceiver. I'm going to go, I'm going to give you this. Number one, talking about no trespassing. Number one, when should we post this notice? I want you to look at our text verse again, Ezekiel chapter number 22, verse number 30. I want to read it again. We may read it again uh, in just a little while, but I want to do it again. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land. That I should not destroy it. Now that ought to make Americans weep right there. I understand this may not be prophetic about America. I understand that. But that should make us take notice. And that should make us pause and wonder if it, the shape that this country is in, I wonder could it be because we have taken down our no trespassing sign. I wonder if the church has taken down some posted signs so that we can be a little bit more. I understand I'm not really talking about Lighthouse. Y'all understand that right now. I believe this, this, this place is stood by the stuff. I'm not saying that. 
But I believe that the church as a whole has taken down our postings and said, y'all just come on in. We'll just, in, in an effort to be relevant in this society, I uh, will go with the flow. Honey, going with the flow is out the window. We need to get a hold of the Word of God. We need to get in the Word of God. And we need to stick by the stuff. We need to say, I know that it's taught. I know that it's preached. But bless God on Monday morning, I'm going to get in the Word myself. On Tuesday morning, I'm going to get in the Word myself. We need to get back to, uh, somebody said it this morning, about the old paths, about the old timers, and the, and the Word that they used to get in. And the times of worship that they used to have. And the Spirit of God that was poured out upon them. I wholeheartedly agree. We need to understand. If we want what they have. Number one, we can't have it. But we're going to have to sacrifice some of these pleasantries. And get back into the Word of God. I got to go. I got to go. Number one, when should we post this notice? Before it's too late. Notice what the scripture said. I, he says, I sought for these things, but I found none. We should we post this notice before it's too late. There's a writer that I like to listen at or uh, read after, and, and uh, he was in, in the course of this book, there was a question, how do we know that it's too late? He said, you'll know it's too late when it's too late. Yeah. How do we know when it's too late for us to post that notice? As a child of God, we have a promise that one day the Son is going to step on the clouds of glory with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. He's going to call us up to be with Him. What We have that promise. And I want today, I want to publicly post this notice if that God may send His Son back tonight. But right now, I want the world to know there is no trespass on my heart. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Need to, need to post it before it's too late. Amen. Immediately. Don't wait till tomorrow. I told Lori, we've had company all week, and I have enjoyed it. I thought for sure I would hate. <laughs> I hand up. I, well, David, I thought I was going to hate it. Leah. You've been here about all week, haven't you? Brother Tim, Miss Cindy, they just, just got here Friday night. Miss Lydia and John. Man, I've enjoyed it. I've had stuff to do. I've had people to talk to that would actually talk back. I mean, I have enjoyed the stew out of it. Had places to go. I mean, I, I just enjoyed it. But listen, before it's too late, I want to tell everybody that I can. Before it's too late, I want to tell my in-laws that there's no trespass. Before it's too late, I want to tell those people at Walmart that there's no trespass. Okay. Before it's too late, before listen, before it's too late, I believe we need to post this notice. Number two, why, why must we post this notice? Look with me. Verse 30, he says and they, that they should stand in the gap before me in the land. A gap is a broken wall or a breach. Now, y'all going to have to help me on this because I got sidetracked on this one. I got plumb tore up because I want you to know the enemy is near. We see, first of all, that there is a gap. There is a, there is a brokenness in the land here in the context of our scripture. I, be, I believe that there is a brokenness today that you and I are facing. And, and I'll tell you, we need to be that one to stand in the gap. Uh, because, of, well, I don't care if we stand up, Caleb. Stand up, what's your name? There is, a, there is a gap right here in the middle of this. And if I want to try to help Caleb get over to here, give me your hand. If I want to help, give me your hand, not your fingers. <laughs> if I want to help Caleb get across the gap to her brother, I am going to have to bridge the gap and bring them two to one. Uh, if we are to bring someone to the Lord, if we are to bring someone to the Lord, uh, we are going to have to stand in the gap. Understand that we are dealing with people that once were just like us. Who once were just as filthy as we are. And they don't know what to say. They don't know where to go. They don't know how to cry out. They don't know when to reach up. But I'm glad that I've been there. I'm glad that I've reached up. I'm glad that I've cried out. And bless God, I'm called to stand in the gap. And I want to reach down and 
we need to stand in the gap. Why? Why should we? Why should we post this notice? Because there's a gap. Then let's notice because the enemy is near. First Peter chapter number five, verse number eight. You know this. He says, "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may." Somebody help me with that last word. Didn't say that he just wants to kind of lick, see what you're really made of. Didn't say that he just wants to kind of brush up against you, see how tough you really are. It says that there is an enemy, and we ought to be sober and vigilant because this adversary, this enemy, I like that it points out who it is. It says, the devil. Listen, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The enemy is near. We see this roaring lion. Now I want to dig a little bit deeper here. We also see this enemy is near in, in, uh, in line with some wolves. Now I'm going to try not to preach right here. I'm going to try to just give it to you and go to the house. But y'all going to have to help me now. In Acts chapter number 20, verse number 29, let's read verse 28. It says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the flock. He says, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. We see grievous wolves. These are, this word grievous, it is severe, violent, cruel, and unsparing. Did you notice what the what the writer says? That there shall be grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. We've seen it time and time again throughout our childhood of what what what, it, what Little Red Riding Hood? Is that who it is? Little Red Riding Hood? Pretty sure that's who it is. A wolf in Mamaw's bed. I don't know what book y'all watched or saw, but that wolf's got a, 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 a cloak on him, a robe on him, in Mamaw's bed. Trying to blend in. We've heard for years about the, the wolf in sheep's clothing. I think what we may have, Brother John, is maybe some sheep and wolves. I think what we may have sometimes is some folks that come in and they try to blend in, but they're really grievous wolves. They're really a wolf that is severe, violent, cruel, and unsparing. These are often among the sheep, but instead of as that lion seeking whom he may devour, at this uh, this wolf is not seeking to maim, but they are unsparing in their violent attacks. Some of you have been there. Some of the worst hurt you've experienced has been in the walls of the church. He said, you better watch out. You better watch out. There's some grievous wolves. Yeah. You said, man, I don't understand. I don't understand, Brother Jamie. I, I thought you were talking about no trespass. And listen, just as, just as the, the, the hymn 323, I love to tell the story for those who know it best, seem hungering mm -hmm. and thirsting to hear it like the rest. You better mark it down. I've already used Kaylee. You better mark it down that Kaylee needs to know, Abby, that there's no trespass in your life. Yeah. 
Caitlin needs to know, Miss Barbara, that you've determined that there's no trespass in your life. And vice versa. Miss Barbara, uh, she's on, how old are you? 16 now? 15 now. Miss Barbara, you need to know that this 15-year-old girl on the front pew that sings her heart out like a country road, you need to know, bless God, that she's determined in her heart that there's no trespassing. And we need to, we, I said, we need to post this thing Amen. because the enemy is here. Right. He can be like a grievous wolf right inside of you. Not only that, but in Ezekiel chapter number 22, verse 27, her, this is talking about Israel again. And man, you read and read chapter number 22. I mean, God is pounding them through the messenger. And he says, her princes in the midst of, uh, in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey or ravening the prey. How do you want to say it? To shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. This word ravening it means to tear, to rend, or to pluck. These wolves will tear at every seam and every fold in your life and in the church. If you, you've seen some people, if they see a string on your back, they cannot, and I'm that way sometimes, they cannot do anything but to reach up and grab it. If you're not careful, they'll grab their own string. And for long, you got a sleeve hanging off. And you got your, your dress hem is, is all messed up because they pulled their own string. I want you to know that these wolf, these raving wolves, if they see something just a little bit out of place, they're going to try to pick at it till they get down and they get it festered. I'm telling you today, we need to post today. This is, this is private property. No trespassing. Matthew 7, verse number 15. It says, Beware false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Yep. In the New Testament, this word ravening or ravening, it means aggressively greedy or grasping. In other words, they cannot get enough. They, have, they are insatiable in their greed. They are always wanting more. Listen to me. At the cost of someone or something else. Yes. They will not offer anything to you, but they will continually take and take and take until you're dried up. Somebody go ahead and help me out. Ravening wolves. Then let's look at the evening wolves. Zephaniah chapter number 3, verse number 3. Uh, verse number 1 down through verse 3. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not the correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Hmm. Here we go again. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. Listen to this last phrase. We'll get it in a minute. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. It says her judges are evening wolves. They know they gnaw not the bones till the morrow. This evening, just the word evening is pretty self-explanatory. It, it just simply means nighttime or at sunset. But as we dig a little bit deeper, we see in this day uh, that these things were written that the Pharisees and the ravenous, uh, they considered the time when the sun began to descend to be called the first evening. Uh, and that is when it uh, begins to draw towards evening, about knocking off time for everybody. About four, five o'clock, that's what they would call this first evening. The second evening is to be the real sunset. And these wolves are some of the most devious, these evening wolves. Uh, they will attack as soon as the sun begins to change the colors of your surrounding. As soon as that beautiful sun gets you sidetracked. Uh, they will come out of their burrows. They will come out of hiding. And they may be called evening wolves, but they are on the prowl. And they are most, uh, most uh, uh, devious. They will attack and they will strip the flesh from their victims. Yep. Uh -huh. But guess what? They will save the bones until another day. Just when you think they've done all the harm they can, they come back 
as the scripture said, and gnaw the bones tomorrow. I remember going through the woods up in Tennessee with my dad. I was on a tractor and I was I was bush hogging and I saw looked like uh, if you if you know what a cattail is, looked like a cattail just exploded and there was no cattails around. I couldn't figure out what it was. And as we began to look, it was deer fur. There's no skin. Right there immediately there was no bones. As we began to kind of rummage around, we just wanted to see what was actually going on. We saw the bones of quite a far distance away, and they were licked clean. They were still wet, Brother David, but they were licked clean. And I want you to know today that we need to say this is private property. There is no trespassing. This is God's property. You may come at me in the evening when you think that I'm tired, when you think that I'm weary, but I want you to know I'm not alone. I want you to know that Samuel's standing there with his sign. I'm, there's no trespass. I want you to know that Kurt's standing there with a sign. There's no trespass. I want you to know there's Kenny standing there with a sign. There's no. The devil may try to attack me, but if we'll hold up that hedge, we'll stand in the gap. There'll be someone there that can help us be sober and vigilant and watch for that atmosphere of the devil. How long, number three, how long should this notice be posted? Ephesians chapter number six, I think, gives us a pretty good example of how long. Verse number 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand Y'all say that word with me, stand Amen. against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to, y'all help me with this, withstand, y'all too white, I need some black right here. Withstand in the evil day, having done all to Stand. What's the very next word? Stand. Stand. Therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. This word stand that's used multiple times there in conjunction with uh, withstand. It is. It means to be stationed, to be set, to remain, to endure, to make firm. It is a military term that means to station. I'm about to run. It means to station yourself and remain there until, mm, until the battle is won. Hey, it's, uh, Ephesians says, having done all to stand, stand there for. Do it. It may be uncomfortable, but stand. You may be the only one standing, but stand. The winds may be battering your face, but stand. Uh, the rains may be falling on your head, but stand. Hey, I'm telling you, the sun may be blistering you. I say, stand, 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 stand there for me. How long should this notice be posted? I believe until the battle's won. Uh -huh. Amen. Number four. You have to help me. Number four, where should we post this notice? We see first. Firstly. Where should this where should we post this notice first? In our hearts. Hearts, very difficult place to describe, to explain. Listen to what it says, Matthew 12, 34. Jesus is speaking. If I'm not mistaken, it's Jesus. I may be wrong, I apologize. O ye generations, or old generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Where, 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 where would he have gotten that? Jeremiah chapter number 17, verse number 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing." Where should we post this notice? In our heart. Jeremiah said that that heart is deceitful. That, that word deceitful, it means sly 
or insidious. It means slippery, steep, or hilly. H-I-L-L-Y. Deceit. I wonder why in the world would it say hilly? What's the big deal about hills? You walk up, you walk down. Brother Dave and Miss Tommy was telling us yesterday about, I, I can't pronounce the word, Am Amicola Falls, something like that, uh, where they had to walk up the, this whole series of steps, trails and things. By all accounts, it's pretty rough, it's pretty steep. Miss Kim shaking her head. <clears throat> pretty steep. Well, I want you to picture in your mind that hill. And it says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. This sleep, slippery, steep hill is a hill that is said to be, I'm using this word correctly, I just don't like the way it sounds. I tried to make up my own word, I couldn't do it. Uh, this is talking about a hill that is said to be a calamity from its retarding and keeping back those who go up. It says the heart is so steep that as you try to tame it, as you try to uh, maintain your balance on it, it will retard your progress in forward motion. It reminds me of that word that we use backsliding. In uh, Hosea chapter 4, verse number 16, it talks about uh, the backsliding heifer. And uh, as you look at that uh, backsliding, it means that they are untamed. It means that they are stubborn. It means that they are rebellious. But I remember again as a young man, uh, someone made the correlation with that heifer and that backsliding uh, to that cow that would try to go up the hill uh, after it had just rained. And when those those hooves get packed, hooves get packed with that dirt and those rocks and those those that mud and all kinds of other stuff. And as it tries to get a footing on that slippery hill, or it may get one foot, it may get another, but before it can get all the way again in forward motion, it begins to slide backwards. And honey, that is a picture of your heart. Every time you think you can trust the heart, you're going to go back. Where should we post this notice on our hearts or in our hearts? Then we notice we should post this in our minds. Y'all still with me? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Where should we post this notice in our minds? Romans chapter number 12, verse number 2. We'll read verse number 1. You hardly can't read Romans chapter 12, verse number 2 without verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I beg of you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. He says, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here we go. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove. I wish I had looked up this word prove to give you something on it. But that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This word conform, he says, be not conformed to this word, world. It means to be fashioned according to a pattern. Not many people do it anymore, but I can remember my mama giving it a shot. She'd go down to the Kmart or to the pick and save, and she'd go back there to the fabric, and she'd find a, a little dress or something like that she'd like, and she'd find that thing, she'd find that number, she'd go down in that drawer, she'd look in that little drawer, and she'd get that, that little uh, squishy packet, she'd take that thing home, she done got all the other stuff, she, she got the button, she got the zipper, she got the fabric, she got the elastic, she got all of this stuff, and she laid it down. And Brother, Je Brother David, I remember looking at it as she opened it up, and I thought, Mama, how you ever? How in the world are you ever going to be able to make that thing? But Brother Jody, I'm going to tell you what's the truth. Uh, she began to take that thing and lay it down. She began to take, so I don't know what kind of tool it was, but I don't know if it marked the, the pattern. I don't know if it cut the pattern out. But before long, that little girl, I said that little girl I had her a dress that looked just like a picture in that thing because she followed a pattern. But God says, don't follow a pattern in your life. Be not 
conform to this world. Amen. Kurt, you are you are warned right here by the writer to do not be patterned after this world. Right. Don't right. do it. Be not conformed to this world. John Phillips wrote, The acts of an individual assuming an outward expression that does not come from within, nor is, rep is it representative of his inner heart. This idea of being conformed, it is one person assuming an outward expression that does not line up with what is within. He says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye, <clears throat> be ye transformed. Here's, I, I said we ought to post this thing in our minds. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. This word transform, I wish I was smart enough to be able to say that big long Greek word. But what I do know is that if we get our word metamorphosis from it. And this word transform means to change into another form. I like it to have spun around in my office chair when I read this by Mr. John Phillips. He says this is an example uh, of a caterpillar which undergoes metamorphosis in its chrysalis and emerges a glorious butterfly. That sounds pretty good right there. I knew that. I, I knew that from school. I don't remember a whole lot, though, Jim, but I knew that. But listen to what he said. The same, the same creature which enters the filmy tomb eventually emerges, but the change is so remarkable that it cannot be recognized as the same. As the same. Hey, I'm telling you on April 24, 1992, I went down a sinner and came up a saint. I went down wicked and vile. I came up fresh and clean. I went Amen. down dirty, wretched, just no good for nothing. But bless Amen. God, I came up. I came up washed in the Lamb's blood. Amen. Hey, I came up pure and white, but I came up changed. Amen. Amen. Right, you came up changed. First Peter chapter number 1, verse number 13. Wherefore, gird up, gird up your loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. We ought to post this notice in our minds. And then we ought to post this notice. This is last. Where should we post this notice? In our hearts. Next, we see in our minds. Last, in our lives. 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 12. It says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. This word, example, Paul's writing to Timothy, a young man. He says, I want you to be an example. This word, it means the mark of a stroke or blow. I don't know if anybody's got one of those old leather belts. Men, you remember those leather belts that we used to have that had our names on the back of it? You were somebody who had your name on the back of your belt. Where I came from, you were somebody. <clears throat> Take that piece of leather that's went through its entire process. That's a whole other message. He says, I want you to be an example. When you take that piece of leather and you, you, you put your die on it, maybe it's the shape of a cross, or maybe some sort of a, a shape or a letter, and you take your hammer and you strike that die. And it leaves an impression in that letter. That's a picture of what an example is. If you take in woodworking, there are many people, I noticed this down at the maze the other day. They would take their finished product and they would have a custom what is it, a brand made, 
and they would heat it up, Brother Jody. And on the back of their custom piece of wood, they would take that hot brand and place onto that wood. And it would sizzle. And it would burn. And it would smoke. But it left an impression. Understand that the Apostle Paul told Timothy, I want you to leave. I want you not just to leave. I want you to be a mark that's representing something else. He says, be thou an example of what? Of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, and in faith. This word conversation in that verse, it means the manner of life. Your very lifestyle ought to be a representation, ought to be a mark or an example of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture tells us that he is the expressed image of God. And if we are, if we are uh, 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 joint heirs with him, if we are heirs of God and we are children of God, then should we not too then be representing God? Has he made a mark in your life? Philippians chapter 4 verse number 8. Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. He gives this long list. True, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, even virtue. He says, he says, if there are any of these things, I want you to think on these things. This word think, it means to reckon or to establish by counting or to compute. He says, I want you <clears throat> to think, to reckon, to count, to compute those things in your life that are true that are just, that are honest, that are pure, that are lovely, that are of a good report, that have virtue. Today, we must unashamedly stand up and declare to one another, declare to God, declare to this world, and declare to Satan himself, there is no trespass. We are God's property. We can. Let's come with a song of invitation tonight.